it's a great honor actually to be here today and uh, to be recognized among this group of uh, amazing researchers. Uh, I would like to thank the CN CNN News team for coordinating this symposium and for giving us a chance to share uh, our experience. So uh, I, today I wanted to tell you about uh, our work on graphene batteries and supercapacitors, but before that, I wanted to uh, take a moment and tell you about my story and how I ended up where I am today. So born and raised in the city of Giza, uh, the hometown of the famous Egyptian uh, pyramids. The city is also hosting the world's largest archeological museum with more than 100,000 pieces on display. So uh, this uh, museum is also uh, the new home for uh, King Tut. And uh, basically it's gonna feature some of his artifacts for the first time ever. This, um, uh, this museum is slated to open later this year. So growing in this historical uh, city had a profound impact on my childhood and also on my career. About 10 miles away from this location, there is the University of Cairo. This is the largest in Egypt and in the Middle East with more than 200,000 students. Over there, I, I studied chemistry. It was my favorite subject. I did, I did very well in class that the University of Cairo offered me a contract that allows me to become a faculty after I get my PhD. I also uh, made some of the best friends of my life. Uh, some of them actually are in uh, leading positions in the chemical and petrochemical industry in Egypt, uh, Africa, and the Middle East. So before going to graduate school, a, I was selected to uh, attend the Nobel laureates meeting in Lindau, Germany. Uh, so uh, over there, I got a chance to meet and uh, get inspired by nearly 30 Nobel laureates. So this is probably the biggest congregation of Nobel laureates after Stockholm, of course. Uh, so that was very inspiring at the beginning of my career. Then came the great news. I got the admissions to uh, UCLA chemistry. So I packed up my bags and moved from the city of Giza to uh, Los Angeles. It's a picture of me here from the airport. I remember at the time I was full of energy, had the resistance to success. I have to deal with a new culture, new people, new society, new language. But at the same time, actually, it was a very difficult time for me because only two weeks before this photo, my father uh, passed away. So I arrived in Los Angeles and uh, UCLA uh, with its beautiful campus here. And over there, I worked with uh, Professor Richard Keener, who's a great researcher and uh, mentor. Uh, he did some, uh, he's actually still very active, doing some very good research on graphene. So he got me interested in, in the subject. So I cannot thank him enough for uh, putting me on this track. So UCLA is also a very good place for collaborations. I got a chance to work with a number of brilliant scientists and engineers, and I would like to thank them for, su for supporting me and for uh, allowing me to work with them. I think one of the uh, biggest challenges in the uh, life of a new graduate student is the selection of a research uh, subject. So uh, at the time, I read a very nice article written by uh, Nobel laureate Richard Smalley about the uh, top 10 problems that are facing humanity for the next 50 years. This is something that researchers need to work on. So energy was coming on the top of the list and basically it became clear to me that I should work on uh, energy here. So when it comes to energy research, there is energy generation, but there is also uh, energy storage. And it's actually uh, energy storage along with electrification here is becoming more important nowadays. Let's look at lithium ion batteries and how they enable our portable electronics, consumer electronics, and they're going into electric cars, military equipment, and even in the space. So they have changed our life, but they also come with their own problems. So how many times you face that situation where your phone ran out of charge and you felt completely disconnected? Probably very frequently. That's because batteries have uh, lots of challenges, lots of problems. So we need to build better batteries and by utilizing new materials. One of those materials is graphene. It's made out of graphite, which is driven from graphite, the same material that you have in your pencil there. So this video here shows a simulation of the molecular structure of graphite. It's made out of these two-dimensional sheets of carbon. And the top layer here is graphene. So this graphene has a number of interesting chemical, uh, optical, and mechanical properties. And it makes it great for uh, energy storage applications, among others. So this graphene sheets will be interacting and will be connected together in the z-axis so uh, weak uh, physical uh, vendor valve interactions, which is why graphite actually is a, uh, a soft material and, and the carbon sheets actually slide off easily as you're uh, moving a pencil against a sheet of paper. So this phenomenon was utilized by two scientists, Andrea Gaim and Konstantin Novizolov, for isolating the first crystals of graphene using a very simple tool, just a scotch tape. 
So they got uh, the Nobel Prize in physics for their discovery. So in chemistry, we try to make graphene in a different way. We start from graphite and then use chemistry to convert it into graphite oxide. This uh, graphite oxide is, is more soluble. It's got uh, these hydrophilic functional groups on the surface that makes it water soluble. So the first samples of graphite oxide were made about 160 years ago by British chemist Benjamin Brody. There's an article here from the year 1859. And I happen to have a, a copy, an original copy of this, uh, very rare article actually on graphene oxide. So I combine this graphite oxide and then with a very simple tool called Lyscraft DVD burner. If you're not familiar with this, this is a simple tool that you can just buy from, uh, from Amazon for like $20 or so. Uh, it was developed by HP engineers about 20 years ago. And what it does is basically have a laser head there, you can see the image, that is used to etch labels uh, of text and images on a DVD disc. So instead of etching labels here, we used it for making graphene. So the process is very simple. We just have a DVD disc, we put a sheet of plastic in it, and then cast graph outside this version, let it dry, put it in the drive, and then tell the computer to draw graphene. So graphite oxide is a brown gel, and after it's been hit with a laser, it becomes graphene here, and it's actually changing its electrical properties from insulating uh, to conductive after this is graphene. So when we analyze the microstructure of these electrodes, we find something interesting. So graphite oxide has got a similar structure to that graphite, I mean, not surprising, but the graphene had a sponge-like structure here or with a lot of porosity. It's when we measured the surface area, we found now that it's got more than 2,000 meters square per gram. What does that mean? So basically, one gram of graphene could stretch to cover an entire photo field. It's amazing. And this is also combined with very fast electron transfer rates. It can actually uh, uh, transfer electrons on its surface about 100 times faster than graphite used in today's batteries. So it became clear to us that we should be using this for energy storage applications. But I wanted to explain to you the difference here between batteries and uh, capacitors. Batteries on the left-hand side and capacitors on the right-hand side. So a battery, a typical example would be lithium-ion. Uh, batteries. They're made out of two uh, electrodes or uh, layered structure. When you're charging the battery, you're moving lithium ions from the cathode to the anode and using the, an external power source to drive the electrons in the external circuit. So you reverse the process and you get your electrons back in a uh, discharge process. So because lithium ions will have to transport a long distance during this process, usually they take hours for them to recharge. Capacitors, on the other hand, they basically store a charge on the circuit. So ions only get a chance to move only atomic distances. So they can recharge very quickly, but because they store a charge on the surface, they can only store a very small amount of energy. So that takes me to the concept of energy and power. So energy is about how much you can store a charge, and power is about how fast you can deliver that charge. Batteries have got high energy, capacitors have got high power, and supercapacitors actually are bridging the gap in between. But how do we make supercapacitors? So basically, look at capacitors, they are made out of two metal plates separated by a dielectric material. Supercapacitors would use porous materials, such as activated carbon, which is a very high surface area, that allows them to store more charge. So here's a simple analogy here that helps you understand the difference between capacitors and supercapacitors. It's just like a piece of uh, plastic and a sponge when you dip into the water. Of course, the amount of water here is equivalent to the amount of charge each of these can hold. So supercapacitor is like a sponge. I just told you that our graphene is about a very high surface area, got porosity in it. So we uh, made some we wanted to use this for supercapacitor applications. So uh, we made our supercapacitors, again, using our LightScraft DVD burner process. We have a DVD desk, we've got a sheet of plastic and a layer of graphite outside, and then we told the computer to basically make graphene, um, just takes about 30 minutes or so. And you have two pieces of graphene, put them face-to-face, -face, a separator and a droplet with the light, you have a symmetric supercapacitor. So we tested the performance and converted it with conventional energy storage devices. And we found out that our energy storage devices here can uh, demonstrate the energy of batteries and uh, the power of capacitors at the same time. So it sounded like we made our version of a super battery that combines the best attributes of both models. So this work when published actually a lot of attention from the news and also got uh, covered in many languages and from different countries. Uh, so that actually uh, brought uh, us to uh, uh, Brian Golden Davis. Uh, he's uh, is uh, basically a film uh, maker and director. So he made a three minute video highlighting our work for the Focus Forward contest on ideas that could change the world. And the title of the video is about the super, super capacitor. So when it was, this was actually a finalist in the contest. And when it was released to the internet, it went viral with millions of views. And apparently it also helped educate people and the uh, public about the subject of super capacitors, something that we learned from Google Trends. 
So Google Trends is actually a very nice tool. You can use it for a particular search keyword. It will tell you how often this, uh, this is uh, being searched for and who's looking for it and from which countries. So when you look at this plot here, we will see that the subject of uh, supercapacitors remained fairly unknown for many years for the public, but then after we released our video, so a surplus increase here in the uh, amount of search after uh, our work. So that was really impressive. And uh, the technique was used by our group at UCLA and several other groups worldwide to make graphene devices for use in energy generation, energy storage, also in chemical sensors, by sensors, uh, in Internet of Things, in uh, robotics, a number of applications. So this technology was kind of interesting, and we actually received many offers to move that technology from the laboratory to the commercial scale. So Professor Richard Kainer and myself worked with successful CEO, Dr. Jack Kavanaugh, and we started Nanotech Energy in 2014. And after many years of development, we now have, we now have these graphene that is available in different form factors, um, like cylindrical cells and bout cells. So uh, these batteries uh, have low cost. They work over a very wide temperature range from negative 40 to plus 60 degrees Celsius. They can be used for over 2,000 cycles, compared at about 500 cycles for a traditional LCO chemistry. And uh, they've got very good energy density and also safe operation. So this excellent performance actually is attributed to uh, the new design of the battery that we have here, which we revisited the role of the electrodes, the separator, and the electrolyte. So we're using graphene in the electrodes to increase the cycling life and to increase the energy density of the battery. But we made also the battery safer by utilizing thermally stable separators and uh, non flammable electrolytes. This is important because traditional lithium ion batteries are not safe. We have seen many reports of battery fires from electric cars here from more, more from pretty much all automakers. You can see some examples here on the screen. The same thing for uh, aerospace industry. There have been more than 171 incident, uh, incidents reported in the last 25 years. And you can see some of the examples here on the screen and you can see the amount of damages can be severe. Uh, same applies to consumer electronics, to portable electronics and uh, power tools. So it is uh, very important uh, to develop a battery that is uh, safe. It's very important for the future electrification and for the future of lithium ion batteries. And this is exactly what we have made. So we built a 5 amp R vouch cell, and we converted it to a similar size uh, cell from the market uh, lithium chloride battery. And we did use a, te uh, a technique called nail penetration. It's very standard for testing the safety of uh, lithium ion batteries. So it basically simulates what would happen if something goes wrong, like an accident. So if you, the nail goes through our battery, basically you see nothing, pretty much a little bit of fumes, but the battery remains uh, intact. But now when you look at the uh, commercial battery, you will see that as the nail is going through, through, through the battery, the batteries are usually made out of uh, thermally unstable components, including a with very low flash points. So as soon as the nail hit it, it will balloon, it will turn red hot, a lot of fumes coming off, and within a few seconds, the battery will catch fire. This is absolutely the situation that we'd like to avoid. So our batteries are very safe. These are pictures here after of the batteries after the test. You can see that the commercial battery got completely burned down, but our battery rem remained pretty much intact. In fact, when you look at the temperature and voltage profiles here for monitoring the cells before and after nail penetration, you'll see on the right side the commercial battery. When you hit it with the nail, the voltage goes down to zero because it's lost in charge, and the temperature will hit about 1,000 degrees Celsius. So there's a cold fire. But our batteries remain cold, and also it maintains its voltage. What does that mean? It actually tells you that the battery is fully functional after nail penetration. So not only is it safe, but it's also functional after abuse. So it's been an interesting journey. So we started from UCLA, at Los Angeles here, where we did the initial work on graphene uh, electrodes, and then we moved up in the north, uh, where we have our research and uh, development labs, and we have our manufacturing facility in Northern California. It's an aerial view here of the facility. And we have our offices and headquarters in Florida, and within the next two years, we're going to be moving to Nevada, where we bought more than 200 uh, acres of land for uh, the large-scale manufacturing of our uh, batteries in the heart of the Tahoe Mino Industrial Park, one of the world's largest, and some of our neighbors are shown here on the screen. You can see Tesla, Google, and uh, Apple, and we are actually at the center of that uh, uh, center. And this is the initial concept here for the first factory that we use for making batteries. So we started with one scientist, and very quickly we were able to attract some of the top talents. Our team now got about 25 uh, brilliant scientists and engineers that are responsible for research and development. And they are part of the bigger family at Nanotech Energy. We now have about uh, 70 to 80 people. So we have other teams that are doing uh, operations, manufacturing, uh, purchasing, uh, 
sales marketing. So our goal at Nanotech Energy is to develop uh, and to manufacture batteries, safer batteries for greener electric cars. With that, we hope that we will be able to convince uh, the, uh, actually, that we hope that we'll be able to uh, to uh, uh, convince the society to put more electric cars on the road. Thank you so much. We'll be happy to take it. Thanks so much, Meher. Um, I'm going to ask you actually the same question I asked David, which was, uh, what would you say was the biggest challenge in moving from an academic discovery to uh, a commercial enterprise? Well, there are there are many of them. Uh, what I would say so far, Nanotech Energy raised about $100 million, and we are going into round E where we're looking for much more than that. But I would say that the first and most difficult to raise is the first million dollars. Uh, because at the beginning, you have nothing. You just have a concept on paper, and you would like to move that from the laboratory to commercial scale. So you need to find uh, the, uh, the funds uh, allocated to make that happen. And uh, second is uh, to basically find uh, the right people to work with. Because it's really not about how smart the idea is, but really it's about the team. If you have a strong team, uh, very well connected, you can actually make a, your idea successful. All right. Thank you so much, Meher.